Well, good morning, True Life. Good morning, Eric. I just had to put that in one more time. I missed it. Anyway, thanks again, Leanne, for doing that. So, a um, few things this morning. I hope that whenever you choose to listen to this, um, it's just a blessed time for you. Along with the music, I know Rich will be sending in, which I'll post with this. and um, We may be getting close to meeting again. We don't know. We'll have to see. Even when they do authorize, kind of have to see what that looks like for a while. Um, and I'll send out an email getting your guys' opinions on that once we get more guidance. But um, I don't know. I'm recording this on Friday morning at this point, so I don't know if I will be getting any more videos or sharings from people between now and when I upload this. Um, so if I do, I will just insert them here. But we do have one from Leanne um, with her and Booker. I'm going to put that in right now for you. Hi, everybody. Booker and I wanted to let you know we're doing great and that we love and miss you all. Say hi, Bug. Hi. Uh -uh. Now blow kisses. Blow kisses. <laughs> okay, say bye. Say bye. Bye. I wanted to share with you, um, our family got this DVD recently. It's The Power of the Air, and it's a movie uh, by Dave Cristiano. He and his brother Rich were one of the pioneers of Christian films, some of the very first that Marianne and I watched when we got into back even in the 90s. Um, this man loves the Lord. And this is a very, very good movie. Um, I found it very challenging. Um, it's the, I don't even want to tell you what it's about, just because honestly, the description doesn't sound that exciting, but we were really very, very pleasantly surprised when we got it. He, they are really hurting right now with the whole streaming things, these small Christian filmmakers who relied on DVDs, outlets going out of business, um, streaming taking over, um, very little revenue in streaming. And so, and especially now with churches not meeting, they can't even stream and do live church showings and things. So they did a short run on these DVDs and we got... Uh, one for the church library, one for our family to try and support them and watched it about a week ago and week and a half and it's like, wow, um, it, it powerfully challenged us in many areas of our life, the entertainment we watch, the things like that. And also is to question what is God asking us to do for his kingdom that maybe we're afraid to do or think we could never do. And um, so called him and talked to him and ended up getting um, a, a bunch of copies of this DVD our family did. And here's the offer we have for you. If you would watch this within the next week, um, within one week of getting it, um, we will drive somewhere and meet you. Um, I'm talking to people, obviously, in our little area here. Um, we will drive and meet you um, and get it to you. And it is yours. Um, I think we've got six or seven that we can do that with, I believe. We've got some also to give to some other churches for their libraries in the area. But um, here's the conditions. One, you got to agree you're going to watch it within a week. Two, and you're going to pass it on to another Christian. This is definitely for Christians. Um, to another Christian uh, within about a week after that. And three, as you watch it, you will be asking God's Spirit to speak to you about what does it mean to be holy, to be pure before God and in our entertainment? And, and what is the power of media and entertainment in our lives? Um, and then the other, it would be, what has God put on your heart that maybe you're afraid to do or feel like you couldn't pull off? Um, and just 
open your heart. And I, I hesitate to even have said that much because um, I know a lot of us really don't want to be challenged or questioned in what we watch or do or we think we're okay in that. Um, I'm asking you as your pastor and your friend, I'm asking you to consider watching this prayerfully. Uh, I have some thoughts on my heart, some things to share with you this morning. And I sat down, usually my method will be to get my thoughts, collect them, put them into notes, and, and teach from that. And every once in a while I have those times when I go to put things on paper and it just goes flat. I don't know how to explain it. It's like the life leaves it. It's There's too much. It's alive in me. And trying to get it onto paper. And I just have to step up to the pulpit um, or the rocking chair in this case and just say, Lord, here I am. Just leave me. I don't believe that's what he's telling me to do all the time. I believe that would be testing him to just say, I don't really need to prepare or anything. And just show up on a Sunday and do that. But this, every once in a while, there comes those times when I might rip my notes up late on a Saturday night and up until the last song of our worship set in the morning, not know what I'm supposed to say. It's an exciting time. It's a scary time, but um, God has always been faithful in that. And again, I don't believe God's telling me to make that the practice of my teaching, but I, this morning is one of those times. And um, begin with, I was taking my personal quiet time this morning and listening. I have a playlist of songs that are not, I guess I would just say they're songs to God, about God. A lot of what we hear in contemporary Christian music or even sing often um, in churches is music maybe praising, you know, what he's done in our lives or things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I just really feel in my personal quiet time and worship, I want songs that are unto God, that are about him, not what he's done for me. I already have such a selfish nature that I don't need to reinforce focusing more and more on what he's done for me. And I'm not, we're, we're supposed to, that's biblical, okay, to, to praise him for what he's done, to be in thanksgiving to. I'm not saying that's wrong. But when I want to just break through in the morning and begin my time, I just want to spend time focusing on him and praising him. And this morning I opened to Revelations, um, and not for the reason that most people are opening to it now. Everyone's wondering, is this the end times and um, the signs of the times and everything. And I think there's value in asking those questions, but that wasn't why I opened it. I just felt like God was leading me to open it and simply go through and look at all the descriptions of Jesus in there and all the songs and praises that were lifted unto him in Revelations. And I may try and go through the whole book one time and cut and paste all those into one single thing that could be read. But it's amazing. Uh, our Father and, and Jesus, our God, wow, I get so caught up in our little dot on the map here, our little place, my little world, and, and it extends maybe as far as our family up north and down south and pretty much have so much going on in my life, in the church, in my community, things I need to deal with, um, whether it's in people's lives or, you know, roof that started leaking in the last rain in two places or, um, you know, whatever. I got so much that it is so easy to just get so self-centered in my views and thoughts that I forget sometimes, I mean, not intellectually, I know it up here, but I forget just who my God is. Uh, and you read the praises and the songs about him. He is a ferocious, vast God. He is holy, pure. The things that we are so casual with in our lives are such an offense to him. The 
the worship that is lifted around his throne, the cries of holy, holy, holy. Our God, his eyes span the, the globe. He sees the masses in Africa and in, in northern Siberia and across Europe and the southern hemispheres. And it's just, he spans the universe. He is huge. He is holy. He is so worthy of our praise. And, and you can't help but visit Revelations and notice also the ferocious judgment and terror that is coming. Um, you know, whether this coronavirus is, you know, part of the, the end times or not, they're coming. Okay, the Bible makes it clear. There is a coming judgment and the eternal future of all that are not right with God It is a terror beyond a, a horror, a loss, beyond anything we can fathom. And whether you believe hell to be a literal place of fire or simply eternal separation from God, the, the torment of that, of realizing there is no second chance and that you have forever been cut off from he who alone is love, good, your creator, the one who no matter how much you thought people on earth loved you, has loved you with a love so vast and powerful that it makes any human love pale. Um, the only place where joy and goodness and purpose is found, to, be, to, to know that for eternity that door has been closed. And all of your friends and loved ones who chose Christ, chose faith, a life lived in surrender and dependence upon him, not just a belief he exists, are in that place of joy for eternity, and you will never taste it, see them again, or be a part of that. And then to see how incredible our God is, as revealed in, in Revelations, and the praise is lifted to him around the throne, his coming return, it just convicts me deeply of how absolutely self-centered and self-absorbed I am, and I think most of the church is. Um, we are so caught up in our little worlds and our little comforts and our houses and our lands, and, um, and he gives us, he tells the rich not to be haughty, he gives them every good thing to enjoy. But I'm not, so I'm not saying these things are bad. But when that which is supposed to be a blessing overtakes that which is the heart of the Father, then that blessings become a curse. And our Father's heart beats for the eternal life of this world, the people of this world, and the future of those separated from him is an anguish. We don't even want to try and fathom. It's so horrible and the joy the magnitude of the joy and the eternal purpose and pleasure and and jubilation of those of us who will be in his presence for eternity free of pain and sorrow sickness death his hand wiping the tears from our eyes if this doesn't drive our life we don't get it we let this little stuff consume us, our little earthly comforts and moments, and, and we don't have a, a sense of what it means to live for eternity, to invest not in treasures here that rust eats up and moths eat up and thieves take, but to invest in, in eternity. So where our treasures are is where our heart will be also. Um... God's heart is on eternity. Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him, lived in the shame and the pain of this earth. 
for what was on the other side. And we are to live the same. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, you know, casting aside the sin and the weights that so easily entangle us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, humiliation. Um, Jesus said, if you would follow me, then take up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow me. Die to yourself daily and follow me. We walk by faith, not by sight. And last week I talked about faith is a movement. Faith is a life lived. His life lived in us and through us as we trust him and, and die to our own and let his life be that which is lived through us. That is the life of faith, not, not the life of sight. And that faith must continue when we don't see what he's doing. We don't see his hand. We don't understand. Um, in that life of faith, as God shapes us to his eternity and to his heart, there's going to be trials. I, I read last week, um, 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. He said, don't be surprised by trials that come upon you like, huh, what's this? This is strange. This is the life that you're going to have in a broken, sin-filled world following me. If my life had no place to lay my head, was betrayed by my closest, uh, even my own family and townspeople, even by one I poured my life into, Judas. If my own creation betrayed me and mutilated my body and mocked me and nailed me to a cross, if I wept, if I grew weary, if... And I beckon you, follow me. Your life... Don't be surprised by the trials. This is the life of following. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. The difference becomes when the floodwaters rise, where did you build that, your house? Are you built on the rock of Jesus and faith and scripture and promises? Or are you built on some foul, shallow foundation that washes away when the storm comes? Um, so... If we, if we leave 1 Peter and we jump back one book to James, you talk about a book that makes it clear that a life of faith is so much more than simply the belief in God's reality the demons have. It is a life that bears the fruit of our faith, that, that faith produces works and faith finds its completion and works. You say, well, this is workspace. No, it's not. Our salvation is by grace alone, not by works that no one would boast. It is by our faith, our commitment of our life into his sin, his, his death for our sin upon the cross and his resurrected life that is now comes into us. But the life that is lived by faith, not by sight, is the life that then lets his life live itself through us, carries out, and his heart beats for the lost. It beats for eternity. It, it beats for his father's glory it it beats for that which is on the other side um it is a life that knew no sin it is holy and pure would the things we get so casual with in our life and thoughts and attitudes and choices and our financial use the the stuff that we pour upon taking care of ourselves um And become part of the lashes that fell upon his back if they become our idols if they keep us from following him fully giving sacrificially of all that we have in our gifts you know it's i don't feel like it well too bad it's not about what you feel it's his life in you um you know we squander our gifts we squander the resources of time and money and and opportunities that he gives us and divine appointments we um and we just make it about us. 
And you can't read Revelations and not realize whether the end times described there are coming today and tomorrow, or whether it's our children's children that will experience them. It doesn't matter. It's coming. And are we living in light of that? So James begins, um, starting with verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So this is what really drew me in this week. These trials test our faith. And as I said last week, there's only one place our faith can be. Faith always has an object. There's only one object for our faith that will allow it to be steadfast and true, and that is God himself, his person, his nature, his love, his trustworthiness, his faithfulness, his character, his promises, his word. And if we think, okay, I know that, I'm a Christian, I have all that, as I said last week, if we find that our joy and our peace goes up and down like a roller coaster through the changing circumstances of life, we may realize our faith has an object of our circumstances, of our conditions, of our bank accounts, of our doctor's reports, um, that is far more than we would maybe want to admit about ourselves. Because as good Christians, of course, we'd want to say, oh, my faith is in God alone, come what may. But our responses will tell us if that's true or not. So here, here James is saying trials... are to be met with, with counted towards joy. And this is towards Christians, my brothers, he said. For the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Our faith in what? Our faith in God, not in his existence. Remember his anger at the Israelites at the Jordan. He said, how long will they not believe in me? He's not talking about my existence. Of course they know he's really parted an ocean, um, a sea. But... In the same way I might say to someone who's doubting, I believe in you. You can do this. I put my confidence in you. He's like, there's the promised land. I promised to your generations. I promised back long before even you entered Egypt 400 years before. I promised I would go in. I promised I would deliver. But you get this report of a few spies that say, oh no, it's horrible in there. And you choose to stone the two men, Joshua and Caleb, to try and stone them who speak faith who speak, trust our God. If he is with us, then they are toast. Um, how long will these people not believe in me despite all the works I've done in their midst? That's what he's talking about by a belief in him, a faith. Here's my life, and I'm going to walk steady. You as Lord over my life, come what may. And these trials, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Steadfastness in what? In faith. Faith in what? In him. That as we can go through these trials, we see that they test our confidence in him. And if we can have a steadfast confidence in him, what is steadfast? Unchanging. He is the only thing in life that is unchanging. So we have a chance in trials to have an unchanging faith, a steadfastness, if we keep it anchored in him. I sat here, I read that the other morning, and it was really cool because something clicked. I was like, Lord, thank you that my roof leaked in two places. Thank you that I have a chance to trust you and see what you're going to do. You know we don't have the money to re-roof our house. You know um, our condition. And you are forever faithful. He, I, I'm tired of all these times I'm consumed with anxiety and, and worry and, and fear about things. And then God always comes through and always is faithful and always takes care of it. And on the other side, I always like, 
I missed a chance to be steadfast in my faith. So I was like, all right, Lord, here's a chance. You know, yesterday I was coming up from our lowland hall on a trailer of firewood and smelled something really not good in the car. And it was like, this pit in the stomach, this sick, it's like, no, this is our only vehicle. Um, all right, Lord, you are the one I've always counted on. And that's the problem is, is even when our bank account is full, our doctor's reports are good, the vehicles are running well and the roof isn't leaking, the rain is coming, the water tables are full, ponds are full, um, the family's in total harmony, and the church is strong, the offerings are really strong, we're exceeding our budget instead of always falling short, we're, um, the attendance is really up, everyone's giving their giftings and, and committed into gathering in the fellowship instead of just kind of whenever it's convenient and fits in among things. And, you know, even when all that's going right, none of that is my place of confidence. He is always my place of confidence and provision. And when I find it changes, when all those things change, or even one of them, I realize I've placed my confidence in the wrong place. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfast. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If we have, there's the thing, if we are steadfast, steadfast in what? In our faith. What is our faith in? In him, his person, his nature, his quality, his promises, come what may. Then it says, as that has its full effect, as we let it run its course through the trials, uh, and blessing and abundance can be a trial as well. It can cause us to think we're self-sufficient, to lose our focus on the person of God, to whatever. We, trials go either direction, just like sin. Sin can be commission, things we do, and omission, things we know are right to do, James says, and we don't do them. Um, but as we let that steadfast and have its full effect and run its course, it says you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Wow, does that not sound pretty awesome? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That only satisfies us if we let him define what we need, who we're to be. And that was only when we have a heart and mind fixed on eternity. He will always equip, take care of our needs and fix us for his plans, which are fixed on eternity. We may think, I'm not lacking nothing. I don't have the latest iPhone, or I don't have whatever, or I have to put a tarp up when it rains, or, you know, whatever. Um, do we trust him? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things that you need will be added unto you. James then in verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast, steadfast in what? In our faith, faith in what? Him under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. When you feel temptation, when you feel drawn away, when you feel that, that is not God doing that. That is coming from within you, your own desires, the own ugliness of our flesh, our self. It is something to be on guard and, and to be reminded of when we are tempted. It's coming from here, not God. And he says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. It's a verse I ended last Sunday with. He does not change. There is no change in God. And don't be deceived. Every good gift comes from him. If you are pursuing anything that is not found in him, it is not going to be good. No matter how good it seems on the outside, if it is not his life and leading, which comes from our faith, which is our surrender and trust to his leading our life and not ourselves. If we're not pursuing it, 
it's not good. If we are not walking out his will and desires that he has prepared in advance for us, and he is at work in us to bring to pass, it's not going to be good no matter how good it seems. So these desires that pull us off that course come from within us. And let's flip back to Peter, this time Second Peter. And... And one four. Let's we'll start with one three. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Okay, so everything you need for life and godliness, He has already granted you through your faith in Him, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. There it is again. Sinful desire leads you out of God's will and out of his path. It's in us. We need to guard against it. But when we say no to that and we guard against it, let his life live through us, is the heart that burns for eternity. When we have the picture of God that calls us to cry out, holy, 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 this God that spans a universe, um, it says we have within us and accessible to us everything that pertains to life and godliness, making us partakers of his divine nature, his image carried through us to the world. And then this is where I'll end. For this reason, very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. Okay, so there's that steadfastness again, something we need to work to supplement ourselves with and to, and to be strong in. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you can't be complacent as a Christian. We can't, as I keep telling our men's group, maturity in Christ is an intentional act. It does not happen by accident. We can be stagnant, spiritually constipated, fat, Christians spiritually fat um, and not be mature at all, be still drinking milk, not be teachers, needing instead to be taught. Uh, but it says, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he is blind having forgotten he was cleansed from his former sins. So if you fall back, if you forget, you get in those old ways, you forget the fire for holiness, you're blind, you've forgotten where he cleansed you from, you're back in that old place. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, again, that intentional decision, the application of what our faith calls us to do and be, the application of holiness and purity in our life, the application of faith, of steadfastness, of, of these things. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. What a promise. I hope that this has blessed you. Um, hope you guys, God bless you. Uh, may his joy and peace fill you this, this week. May you choose to let it. It's also not an accident. It is a fruit of the Spirit of abiding to him. As we surrender to him, his Holy Spirit finds its life fully occupying us. And our faith chooses to trust in God and the things of God. And that's when we live a life pure and obedient and find the fruit of that as the love, the joy, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, that peace that floods our heart as we lay it in his hands beyond understanding. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Please keep sending me the videos, the songs, musicians. You have so much to offer us. The updates the pictures let me know if you want us to bring one of these dvds by we can just leave it in your mailbox whatever um don't forget the library at church has amazing movies to fill your heart with books kathy or i are happy to meet you there um god bless you
Bye-bye.